I think many of you uh, who've known me for quite a while already know this about me. Um, you know, I was baptized Catholic as a baby, but I was not raised in the Catholic Church. As a young man, I was confirmed in the Antiochian Orthodox Church. As a teenager, I was a member of a Pentecostal church, and in college, I dabbled with Buddhism and Taoism. Mine is what is called a Beatles conversion. It's a long and winding road. My experience in the Orthodox Church really is what led me back to my home, the Catholic Church. There are more similarities between the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church and perhaps many other Protestant churches that unite us rather than those differences which divide us. One thing that would be fairly familiar to all of us would be the Easter liturgy. At our Easter Mass, one of the most prominent features is that of light. The liturgy is preceded by the lighting of the Paschal candle, and the church, darkened at the beginning of Mass, is slowly illuminated as each one of us lights our candles from the Paschal candle and then shares that light with those around us. Finally, the entire church is brilliantly lit up as all the lights come on, giving dramatic symbolism that Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, is the light of the world. I remember once spending Easter, Easter vigil at a primitive Orthodox monastery in Northern California. There was no running water and there was no electricity at the time there. At the beginning of liturgy, the abbot led the people out of the darkened church and into the even darker forest night, led a small procession around the monastery grounds and then back to the church doors, which were now closed and locked. As our eyes tried to adjust to the dark, the abbot pounded on the door three times and he exclaimed, lift up your heads, O gates, and be exalted, you everlasting doors, that the King of glory may enter in. And the doors of the church were suddenly swung open and light from a thousand candles poured out into the dark night. It's a stunning symbol of how the light of Christ overcomes the darkness of sin. I wonder, how often do we feel like we are still stumbling around in the dark, on the edges of the church, the church that offers us light? I know I've felt that way often. Although we've been baptized and we've received the sacraments, I have to ask myself, what are the values of this world that I surround myself with, that keep me blinded, that prevent me from seeing Christ in myself and in others? What are the things of this world, my selfishness, my pettiness, my egotism, that blind me? How often am I blinded by the lie that having more things will make me happy? How often am I blinded by the deceit that circumstances must always go my way? How often are my own eyes darkened to my own personal failures? Or how often is my sight impaired by focusing on the sins of others? How often does my false hope in the passing and vain things of this world often keep me from seeing clearly? These are things to consider as we continue our journey through these dark days of Lent closer and closer toward the light of Christ at his resurrection. The Pharisees in the Gospels, they claim to see because they know the law and the prophets. If they were blind to the author of the law and the prophets who was standing right in front of them. And the Pharisees, because they trusted in their own righteousness, were blinded to their own sin and their need for a savior. The Pharisees sought salvation in their own works, their own effort, their own knowledge and understanding, and perhaps even in a sense of superiority and false security in their own righteousness. In a few minutes, our elect, the catechumens, who only a few weeks ago participated in the rite of election with Bishop Muggenberg, will come forward for their second scrutiny. The scrutinies, one of the rites of Christian initiation, they are meant to help the elect in their own discernment, their own enlightenment, their own repentance. The scrutinies are meant to uncover and heal all that is weak and defective and sinful in the hearts of the elect and to bring out 
and then strengthen all that is upright and strong and good in them. Scrutinies are meant to help lead the elect, along with us, into the light of Christ. <clears throat> However, our own preparation for the coming of the light is not a mere ritual. Our own continuing conversion and the conversion of these elect is not simply so that we can all recite Catholic theology or quote the catechism or know when to sit and to stand and to kneel. Our own ongoing conversion, indeed all that the church does, is meant to lead us to a deeper relationship with the person of Jesus Christ. Although the blind man in today's gospel is healed by Jesus, this healing does nothing other than simply restore his physical sight. When he's questioned about the one who heals him, the blind man knows nothing. <clears throat> his physical blindness has been healed, but he needs to be enlightened. And our own daily conversions are also a means of continued enlightenment for us. Although the blind man has been touched by Jesus, he does not yet know Jesus. And that is the purpose of our conversions, of our enlightenments, to know Jesus Christ. It is not until the blind man meets Jesus after a period of searching, sees Jesus face to face, calls Jesus Lord, and worships him, that the man is completely healed of his blindness. So the rites of the church continually call all of us into that same relationship. The sacraments, and most especially the Mass, help us to see the light of Christ more clearly. And through the Eucharist, the body and blood of Jesus Christ, we are strengthened to go into the world to be light to those who stumble in the darkness. As we approach the end of our Lenten fast, may the words of St. Paul to the Ephesians in our second reading encourage us and give us hope. Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. <clears throat>